John chapter 17, and we'll start with verse 1. All right, if you'll stand for the reading of God's Word. John chapter 17, verse 1 says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested manifested your name to the men who you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known all the things which I have given me and from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just so I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I have sanctified myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but I also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be as one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have, have you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me be with me where I am, so that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love which you love me may be in them, and I am them. May God bless the reading of his word, and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, again for this morning. Open up our hearts and our minds. Keep the distractions away. Help us to write these notes down. Help us to apply it to our lives, Lord. Help us to, when we get out of here, Lord, that we can carry these words with us, Lord. And we thank you so much, Lord, for this beautiful passage in Scripture for us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, you may be seated. Talking about today that this is Jesus' prayer for oneness. In the verses that we see, Jesus was actually praying for all of his followers. Now, to think about this, now, Jesus is praying for us. Isn't that pretty cool? Jesus is praying for us. This should be a time to where we think about it and we understand that Jesus actually took time to pray to the Father for us. And he prays in these verses for oneness. For the disciples who were there in verses 6 through 19 and in the future church in verses 20 through 26. He prays for oneness for all of us. For oneness. I want you to think about that. One thing about a Southern Baptist church, especially the Southern Baptist church here at Lighthouse Baptist Church, is this. Do we know how to fellowship with one another? Yes. Okay? Do we know how to have fun this morning? Do we know how to laugh? Do we know how to enjoy each other's company? Or do we walk around here all gloomy? Or do we walk around messing with each other and picking with each other? That's part of it. Showing that we love each other. You know, because that's one of the ways that you can do it. It's just not by being so stiff all the time and showing that oneness with each other. I love you, but if I love you, guess what? 
This is not, this is the words from my, if I wrote a Bible, I would say it like this. If I love you, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> All right, so that's one of the things that, and some people I'm just afraid to pick on. So if you're one of those, I just back up. Hey, I love you, but you scare me. No, I'm just kidding. But at oneness is one of those things that happens in our life, in the life of a church. What is another way that us as Southern Baptists or show oneness is through going out and serving? And we'll talk about that toward the end of the sermon. We'll tell you exactly what the Southern Baptists were brought about for at one time. But we go and serve. We want to serve and, and join together and unite together to serve one another and serve other people. How about another thing? What, what's the one thing you think of when you really think about Southern Baptists? Food. food. <laughs> now, and without hesitation, somebody says food. Food brings us together. It's knowing that we're coming to an end on Wednesday nights. And what's your, uh, what's your uh, reply to that, Deborah? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, she's happy <laughs> because the kitchen will be closed for the next three months after May, um, starting at the end of May, or uh, starting in June, should I say. But we love fellowship with food. It's one of those things that we do. Matter of fact, um, a second grade teacher gave an assignment to her class for the students to bring an item from home that represented their religious background. She wanted to teach the kids about the diversity in the world about worshiping God. At show and tell time, they began to share with what their particular idol meant to their faith. So here comes a Catholic child. He brought some rosary beads, right, and shared with the class how they used the beads in prayer. There was a Native American child who brought a dream catcher. He captured their dreams and that, that they had in the night, and they placed it above their head. It would filter out the bad ones and hold the good dreams in their memory. Well, a Jewish child bought a candle and shared how it was used to celebrate Hanukkah. One particular kid pulled out some food out of his bag. He said, I'm Southern Baptist, and I brought a chicken casserole. <laughs> Amen is right, because that's what we do, is that that oneness comes in with our food, don't it? But the oneness that Jesus is talking about, you know, could it be talking about food? Could it be talking about servanthood? Could it be talking about us laughing together? I absolutely believe with all my heart that with laughter and food and fun, when you bring those three together and you have a good time with each other, it brings oneness together. Why do you think today that people still and families still meet together at holidays is because it's to go and have a good food and fellowship and fun and laughter? How many of you go, well, I don't even want to see that because you'll be telling on yourself. I was going to say, how many of you go home during Christmas and have that kind of, so some of you don't like where you, you come from, so you might not have that good a time. But what I'm saying is that oneness comes with us. It's part of us, it's, especially in the body of Christ. In my family, we still meet for Sunday dinner every Sunday after church. I mean, my mom cooks a big meal for my brothers, uh, my two brothers, my sister, their spouses, their kids, their kids' kids. And, yeah, we don't got down to uh, grandchildren. We hadn't got, yeah, we got down to great-grandchildren now, even in the family. So they're not mine now. I, I'm only an uncle to these, <laughs> not no great-grandparent. But what we do is we have a lot of fun when we go around there, and, and it brings us together as one. You see what happens when we come as, as that's a family, that's a blood tie. That means that we're going to be close together, okay? But when we become children of God, what does it actually signify? That we are children of God, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And you're talking about there should be no greater bond than the bond that Jesus Christ brings us. And brings us into this oneness, this closeness together. Why is that? Because our purpose is for what? Is to evangelize the world, is to tell other people about Jesus Christ so that we can have more people one day to be up in heaven with us when we die. I want to know that people know Jesus Christ. Your common bond is the same. So it brings us into something different than liking the same food. Brings us into same, a little bit different than liking the same sports. Right? It brings us a little different in being the same color. It brings us into something unique. Something unique that nobody else in the world has. It's saying that I am a child of God. That I am one with Christ. Nobody else in all the world can claim that but a Christian. I am one with Christ. And as we're one with Christ, we should be one with Christ but one with each other. 
Remember always that our relationship first goes vertical, up and down, between us and God. Next, it goes horizontal between us and others. Our oneness should be so close to each other that we should be loving each other and caring for each other as a family. And, and the thing about Lighthouse Baptist, I will tell you this, and I'll brag about Lighthouse Baptist. You always feel the love here. I mean, even we might not always get along. We might not always see eye to eye, but I always feel the love here. I always feel that there's somebody that, that loves me here and that I love on, and, and I see other people loving on. And it's the oneness that we have in Christ. So Jesus prays this prayer on the brink of going to the cross. You know, this is the eve of going to the cross. And then he prays this prayer, and he prays it up to his Father. And a beautiful prayer that he prays for us. Number one, I want to talk about some of the things that he prays for in this prayer. Number one, and there's so many, these are just three, three nuggets that I pulled out of it. Trust me, there are probably 5,000 nuggets in this one prayer that you could pull out of. So when you say, come to me after church and said, you should have made this point. <laughs> I could have made a thousand other points. But this is what God laid on my heart for you to hear today. Jesus prayed for salvation. I want you to look at uh, verse 1 in chapter 17. He says this. He said, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son and your son also may glorify you. As you have given the authority over flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this eternal life that they may know that the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Jesus prayed for not only his disciples, anybody that was hearing the word at that time, and even the future church, he wanted to make sure that they come to know Jesus Christ. Because just because they were following him did not make them a disciple of Jesus Christ. Do you understand this? That there were 12 guys that followed Jesus all throughout. In verse 12, it talks about except for the son of perdition. It's talking about Judas. Judas went among them, followed them, went along, done everything that the other disciples did, but they were not his disciples. Just because you go to church does not make you a disciple of God, does not make you a child of God. So now he's saying that, hey, you know what? Just because you're here, you're hearing my word, don't mean that you're actually hearing it to become a child of mine. I want to make sure that everybody that's following me, this is Jesus talking about uh, all the followers that were around him at that time. He's saying, I want all of you to come to know me in a relationship, right? I want all of you to know, I know you know of me, you see me, okay? But I want you to know me. I want you to know me in a deep fellowship, in a deep relationship with me. That's the difference between it. And not only was he talking to the followers of that time, he's talking to the future church. He's talking to us today. Telling us that if you're sitting in church today, let's just rephrase that if it's Jesus was up here talking. And he says this. He says, hey, if you're in this congregation today and you're hearing about the blood of Jesus Christ, what are you going to do about it? Do you going to walk out of this door and then nothing changed your life about it? Or is it going to impact your life because you're a disciple and you hear the word of God and you want to apply it to your life? Now, that's exciting to me. To be a disciple of God means that you're going to change your life. We talked this morning in, uh, uh, in Sunday school about sometimes, you know, you're on a spiritual level than somebody else. So somebody else may not be at that point that you're at. The goal is not to talk about them. The goal is to bring them up to where you're at. You got what I'm saying? And, and when we understand those things, we'll know that our ultimate goal is to make sure that you know Jesus Christ. Do you know that just because there's people, do you realize that that we try to make sure that anybody that teaches Sunday school or, or leads in the church, we try, to, we try without a shadow of a doubt to make sure that they're children of God because they have demonstrated those qualities. But, you know, every now and then somebody can serve in the church and look like a child of God but really not be a child of God. You know, and that's what Jesus is saying. He says, I want you all. Father, you gave them to me. You hear? You see that? We always think that, that uh, have you ever thought about this? We always think that God gave Jesus as a gift to us. Have we ever thought that we were given as a gift to Jesus? You know, when Jesus went to the cross and he died for us, you become his children. Listen, you become his now, and all of a sudden, God has given me as a gift to Jesus. Ain't that pretty cool? So it goes both ways, don't it? So when we think about this salvation that he's praying for, you know, that means that he cared for the souls that was here and, and throughout this. So let's take a look at what Jesus saw. As he looked over the multitude, 
Now, how do we know that there were multitudes? We know that all throughout Scripture we see that he went up on a mountainside to pray while, or to speak, and he, and he gave the Sermon on the Mount. Did he go up on that, mountain t- on that mountainside because, you know, he just felt like going up and climbing a mountain and he figured I'd be elevated and higher than you? No, he did it so he could see everybody, that he could tell everybody. He went on the mountainside so he could speak out to people. One time he got into a boat because there were so many people. He had to come up with another idea. So he got up in the boat. He got created, got out in a boat far enough from the shore to where he could teach to the multitudes. There were multitudes that followed Jesus all around. So what did he see as he saw through this? What did he see through the multitudes that was there? I want you to think about some of the things. Did he see John in the church of Ephesus? Did he see Saul? You remember Saul? Maybe, maybe Saul was somewhere around, you know? And, and maybe he saw that, well, maybe he didn't see Saul because he hadn't become a believer yet. But what did he see? He saw Judas. Now, when Judas was gone, you know, they replaced him with another disciple. But, but who else come along too was Saul. When Saul changed his life and he became Paul, what did he see through Paul? Paul was going to what? Evangelize churches. And throughout Europe, there's going to be churches that start up because of the ministry of Paul. Right? When he saw Peter. Did he see Peter as, well, Peter, there's that coward Peter. Did he look at him as that? He's the one that's going to deny me. Did he look at him as that? Or did he look past it and he saw the multitudes that would come to know Jesus Christ because of the sermon that Peter Peter would preach? You see, what Jesus saw was when he was saying and praying up to the Father, looking over the multitudes, he could see that. He could share that, hey, this is, I want these people to come to know Christ. As he's looking over the church today at Lighthouse Baptist, he's saying, I want to know you. Isn't that awesome? There's nobody excluded. He's not looking at somebody here and saying, I don't want you. You're not good enough for it. I don't want you. You're not good enough for it. He's saying, every one of you, as he points it to you, Every one of you is good enough for the gospel. Every one of you, not good enough, let me rephrase that, but, but you are valuable enough to him to where he says, I want you to receive me as my Lord and Savior. Isn't that awesome to know that there's nobody excluded? You want to talk about somebody that didn't, that broke any kind of racial barrier whatsoever? It was Jesus Christ. He says, everybody, all are welcome. Right? That should go to show us, and one of, the, one of the things I love about Lighthouse Baptist is this is true. They will welcome all. Does not matter, does not matter. Welcome all. They will welcome all to come in here and worship with us, okay? So that's the great thing about it. All right, so he prayed for salvation. He prayed for unification. Look at, uh, we're going to skip up over to verse 21 in chapter 17, but verse 21. He says that all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Unification. I want to tell you, first of all, what the definition of it is. Unification is this. The process of being united or made into a whole. I want you to think about that. When, I read the definition because I wanted to get a really good understanding of unification. That it makes us as a whole. It makes us being united as a whole. Meaning, in other words, that we're not just individuals. We are individuals. But we're also a family of one. We're as a whole. So As I said, on the brink of uh, uh, facing the cross, he prayed this and asked for one thing. Uh, The main thing was he asked for, he wanted to make sure that there was unity among his followers. Seven times throughout this prayer, Jesus asked his followers to make his followers one. You know what? They would be united as brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether you like me or not, whether you you feel like... uh, you know, I'm a good preacher or not, whether anything about me, maybe, again, you don't like my bald head or whatever it is you don't like. But check this out. I, if you are a child of God, that means that you have received Jesus Christ as Lord and your Savior, and you started living for him and you made him Lord over your life, you are my brother or sister in Christ. Just like, you know what happens with blood? You know, they say you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Well, guess what? You can't choose your family when it comes to the Lord either. Because we're one. 
But it's because you don't like somebody or you don't like their ways about them. Where's their heart at? Do you know their heart? Do you know their heart loves God? If you know their heart loves God, you can get past all the other stuff that you don't like about them. Because our united should come with our love for Jesus Christ. Shouldn't come from any other thing. So when we are united, it brings us together. Right? The gospel cannot be fully effective in any group or church unless there is unity among the believers. If there's disunity between us, if there's fighting and there's arguing and there's bickering, you know what? It makes the gospel ineffective. What makes it effective is that people see us and that we love on each other and we're laughing and we're enjoying each other. That's what people see. It brings unity. And people want to be a part of a family that has unity in it, right? And so I want you to think about this. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in the New Testament do you see isolated believers. Do you hear that? Nowhere in the New Testament do you see isolated believers. You know why? Because we need each other. The disciples, I want you to think about this. On the brink of that same night, on that same night, Jesus took the disciples and he took off their shoes and he, their sandals and he washed their feet. He made sure that he washed their feet. Why? Because he was a servant. He was showing servanthood to his disciples. Now, the disciples saw all this and they knew that they probably felt strong at that time. But what was going to happen in the future? The disciples were going to go through some things. They were going to go through some persecution. They were going to go through, matter of fact, they had already been arguing who was going to be the best and all this other stuff. You know, letting that pride slip in. Peter was going to go out and what was he going to do? He was going to deny Jesus three times. What do you think happened? Everybody understands the story about what happened with Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times. Now, I want you to understand this. Does everybody realize that, yeah, Peter done something horrible. But what would have happened to Peter if some other disciples wouldn't come up beside him and said, Peter, you made a mistake, but we still love you. You see where it goes? Unity comes together. We love on each other. You're going to make mistakes, by the way. You're going to make a lot of them. You're going to make tons of them. And let me tell you something. It's that when you have a united body of believers that can come beside you and say, I know you messed up again. It's okay. It's okay. Where does that grace come in? Where does our grace, where do we lose that grace? Where do we, where do we draw the line? What, wh wh where do we draw the line? What did Jesus say? You forgive your brothers how many times? 70 times 7? So in other words, our grace is supposed to run out? Jesus' grace never run out. I'm not telling you to be a doormat and let people walk all over you. But I am telling you when somebody with a sincere heart and they come back and say, man, I really apologize. I know I've done something wrong. You know what? Grace should be offered. And if you don't offer that grace, guess what? You've lost your testimony. And with that unity, that's what happens. We are grace offers because there's people in the body of Christ that's going to mess up. And when they mess up, we go beside them and we help them to understand that, hey, it's okay. We all mess up. Now, come on. I want to encourage you to get back up and walk that walk again. Okay? So, Jesus prayed for salvation. He prayed for unification. Third thing is this. He prayed for cooperation. Cooperation. Listen to this uh, definition of this. The process of working together to the same end. What happened? These disciples, these followers of Jesus, they needed to work together. If we work together, then other, other people will know how genuine we are. If we know that we cooperate together, come together and say, for a common cause. What's our common cause? Is to bring people to Jesus Christ. This is what we need. We need cooperation among each other. Even though we don't like each other, we don't like some things about each other, fine. I don't care. You know how many times I've get people say stuff to me every single day of my life that I don't like? I mean, seriously. I mean, if I just said that, you know what, I'm sick of this person, I'm done with them. But you know what, I know that they're human and some things are going to come out of their mouth that they won't. They don't want to say sometimes and wish they could take back. Cooperation means this, that we work together no matter what, that we stay together. So what does it take to cooperatively work with each other? I want you to think about this selflessness. You cannot be selfish. And be part of a cooperation that works together. Guess what? Yourself has got to be thrown out. I'm not important. Everybody else is more important than me. 
Get that mentality? Can I get an amen just to see if somebody's awake? Okay, thank you. Man, y'all making me think he's sleeping out there. I'm watching you. You know you can sleep with your eyes open, by the way. Teamwork. Teamwork. When we work together, we have teamwork. And we work together. You know what? This is what happened when, <laughs> boy, we used to play softball tournaments. And uh, when we get in those softball tournaments, and one thing about it, you can go against this one team, they can be talking all the trash in the world. I mean, just getting all up under your skin and start, boy, there ain't no way y'all going to beat us. Y'all might as well go home. All, talking all kind of smack. But you know what would happen when we start winning that ball game? You know what they would start doing? they start fussing with each other. They start fussing with each other. Things didn't go their way, so they start fussing with each other. You see, that's not what we do. As a team, as we work together, guess what's going to happen? Things are not going to go our way all the time. We get over it. We get over it. And we still work together. That's what a team does. If you understand this is a team, this is a family, this is a team, nothing's going to break us apart. You should not let anything break this church apart. You should not let anything break you from this fellowship. If you're living the right kind of life in God, nothing can break you away from this. We should stay united and we should have that cooperation among believers every single day. And then we need that encouragement. Encouragement. You encourage one another. You tell somebody, hey, you know what? Again, when something's not right, you encourage them. When you see somebody that's down, encourage them. That's what we're about, cooperation. There is a, in, in, uh, again, please don't ever get tired of hearing this word. I know you hear it a lot lately, but that's okay. It's a good, it's a good ministry, I promise you. <laughs> but, but Kairos and Kairos, they give me this talk every now and then. Uh, it's called You Are Not Alone. And in You Are Not Alone, these scriptures are read. And it, what it's telling them is that they're telling them that you are not alone, that the church can be right here among you, that you can have people and children of God that are around you, that you can build the church around so that you don't have to feel alone. Well, in this, it talks in, uh, in, in Ecclesiastes verses, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Listen to this. As I read through this, I want you to think, does this sound like it's better to have somebody beside you or, ha- or be alone? Ready? Because, listen, we cannot run this Christian race with being a lone ranger. Right? The lone ranger had Tonto, didn't he? You got to have somebody beside you. Listen to what Ecclesiastes says. He says, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. Who was talking? Here's Solomon talking. This is toward the end of his life that he wrote Ecclesiastes. Now, Solomon is a pretty interesting character, by the way. Solomon was the one that had the wisdom. He wrote the book of wisdom, right, which was Proverbs. He also brought the, you want to read a good uh, romance novel? Read Song of Solomon. All right, there's a good romance novel for you. It's better than any soap opera you could watch. All right, then at the end of his life, though, he he was getting a little discouraged and down, and this is what he was writing. He said, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So listen to this one. A man all by himself is alone. This is pretty simple, but he's alone. When you don't have the body of Christ working as a cooperation and being in unity together with other believers, you're alone. You might have been one of those people that come into the church today because somebody asked you or whatever reason, and you've been alone out there. And you know what it feels like. You know, some of us, all of us, or every one of us at one time or another has been out of the church before probably sometime in our life. And you know what it feels like. It feels like you're all alone. Well, you know what he says? He says, his work is endless. His life is empty. His activities are not enjoyable. And his friends are evaporating. This is what Solomon was saying. But as a man 
with a church family is alive. I want you to listen to this. You can gather more fruit. It says two or more are, are two or better than one because they have a good return for their labor. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be bringing people to Christ. You can't do that being a lone ranger out there by yourself. You need people to encourage you to continue on to keep what you're doing. You can go further. If either one of them falls down, one can help the other up. Falls down. You can go further. When you fall down, guess what? You know what Satan would like for you to do? Listen to me, guys. I know y'all about to fall asleep on me. Get with me now. I'll get louder so y'all can get, y'all wake up. I ain't got a podium to beat. I ain't got one of them old wooden podiums that the pastors used to beat on. Pow! You know, it wake you up. I don't have one of those. So I just raise my voice. So listen to this. When one falls down, one falls down, you know what Satan wants to do? He wants to trip you up. And when you trip up and fall down, he wants to keep you down. When you're by yourself, you can't get back up so easily. So you know what you need? You need somebody to come alongside of you and pick you back up and say, come on, brother, let's go again. Let's run this race together. Come on, keep it up. You can do it. So you see how important that it is. You can go further. Then the the next thing, you can get up faster. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Can you imagine laying there? On the ground. You ever been in that situation? Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Remember that commercial? What happens when you're falling and you can't get up and ain't nobody around to help you? That ain't no good feeling, is it? Your back ever went out or, or you had something happen, an injury happened, and you lay in there and ain't nobody around? That's got to be a, a pathetic thing. I hadn't had it yet. But I can imagine what it would feel like. And all of a sudden, somebody's there not to pick you up or nothing. But what about that person when you got somebody there that can always pick you up, right? You can get up faster. You can gain a friend. It says if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? What happens to keeping warm? You know what happens when you're out there in the world by yourself and you're trying to live this Christian life by yourself? You know what it is? It's cold out there. It's cold out there. The world is cold. And let me tell you something. If you don't have somebody to come in and warm you up and a good fellowship of good Christians together to warm you up, it's going to get cold. And the last one is you can grow a fortress. Though many be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now you hear that? Now what does the Bible say about where two or more are gathered? In my name, there are, I will be in your midst. Right here, Solomon saying that, that two or three is better than one by itself. It gets stronger. It holds up a fortress. So what happens when Satan comes to attack you? What's going to happen? You're going to want to fall down real quick. So when you get out of church, I'm telling you, when you get out of church... Guess what? Satan is looking at you like an easy target. It ain't going to take much effort for him to bring you down. But what he's looking for is he's looking for that unity among believers. He's looking for that cooperation among believers. So listen to this. I'll, I'll finish it up by telling you this. The Southern Baptist Convention is an example of cooperation. Now, the Southern Baptist, the earliest Baptist conventions began in England in the 17th century. And they were formed to accomplish together what they could not accomplish alone. I want you to think about that. They were formed so that they could accomplish more than they could alone. So in other words, churches as individuals, if we don't join together, we got other Southern Baptist churches that we have in our association. First of all, we have the Savannah Baptist Association. It means all the churches in the Savannah area and outlining areas. Uh, Maybe it includes uh, all of Chatham and Effingham and places like that. So, and then you have other associations in the state of Georgia. Then you have the Georgia Baptist uh, Mission Board is what it's called now. Now these churches together can accomplish more than one can. Then you have more than one association can. Then you have the Southern Baptist Convention, which is uh, all the churches in a whole. And what they do is, right, you understand it, North American missions are supported, that we're able to support people out there that are in colleges and around the country that are church planners to help them with their missions. What do we do with the International Mission Board? We are able to plant missionaries in other countries so they can tell people about Christ and we can support them. By the way, you may not know this, but I will tell you, the Southern Baptists have the, uh, the, um, the um, most well taken care of missionaries in the field out there. They are taken care of. In other words, they're not suffering for food or trying to get food. Their needs are supplied for so that they can do what they need to do. You see, that's what um, they were involved in missions, fellowship among churches, and to preserve uh, doctrinal integrity. Let me tell you what happens today. If If the Southern Baptist Convention wouldn't have come about, 
if the, the church in England wouldn't have come about with this Baptist, right, this convention, let me tell you what would have happened. Number one, we would not be as much involved in missions. Number two, we wouldn't have fellowship among the churches. Every Monday morning, I meet with other pastors during uh, a fellowship, and I'm able to see them and able to know what's going on in their church. And we join with churches and do stuff sometimes. And the other thing is to preserve doctrinal integrity. Ready? I'm just, I know I got into the Southern Baptist stuff for just a second, but I want to tell you this real quick. Do you know that if it wasn't, you know why, you know one of the reasons that I will not leave the Southern Baptist faith? It's just the denomination, just to let you know this, just talking about cooperation and how good that we are at cooperation. All right, so if, if, uh, what we are is a denomination. We're Southern Baptist, that's a denomination. There are other denominations like Methodists and, and Lutherans and Presbyterians and the list goes on. Are is there anything, are we better than them? Absolutely not. Do they believe that John 14, 6, the way, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me? Do they believe that a relationship with Jesus Christ is the way to get to heaven? Absolutely. There's nothing greater about us than them. But the one thing the Southern Baptists do that, that is better than anything else that I think that we, we can do is keep this word of God and we don't fall from it. We keep this as strong and we will not, we will not budge on it. You'll see churches and denominations all the time that sit there and let stuff slip into their churches. The Southern Baptists will not do it. You know why? Because we're cooperation. We cooperate together because if one does it, everybody's going to do it. So guess what? You can get voted out of Southern Baptist Convention as a church. You can get voted out of Georgia Baptist because uh, if you start believing and start doing the things that are against this Bible and what we hold to as the Bible, guess what? They'll vote you out of there. The reason why is because we want to be corporate together. I hope that doesn't sound harsh to anybody. What we're trying to tell you is this, is that we want to believe in the Word of God, and that's what we're going to stand on. So when we talk about when Jesus prayed, pray for the salvation, what should we pray for? We better be praying for salvation. Now, once those people get saved, they're supposed to what? They should be going in and getting involved in the church. When they get into the church, what should happen then? Unification should happen. You should be united with other believers. If you're here today and you had not been united, guess what? I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? All right, don't, don't throw stones at me. I'm fixing to tell the truth, though. If you're not united with another believer, it's your fault, okay? Because you have an opportunity, all right? Then once you get united with other believers, what happens then? You start working together in cooperation you start working together and now what happens we're united we got the common cause of knowing jesus christ our lord and savior we're united in that cause and now we're going to cooperate together to reach other people for that cause that's what it's about it's what jesus prayed for and we need to learn to pray for that ourselves and we need to learn that same thing in our own lives and in the lives of our